Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Wayne Brecha. I'm the policy director with the Utah League of Cities and Towns, and I would like to thank you for participating in today's uh, roundtable, the question, persuade, and refer um, training for suicide prevention and mental health in our communities. Um, today, as part of our, our presentation, we have Council Member Mike Mendenhall, who is also the uh, League President, and Seth Perrins and Susan Chapman, who are also a Spanish fork. So we'd like to, to thank them for participating. Just a few, um, uh, just a little information here. This meeting is being recorded. And if you are not speaking, if you could make sure to remember to mute your audio. If you would like to participate throughout the roundtable today, we're asking that you can either drop a question in the chat box, or if you could also um, raise your hand, use the raise the hand feature um, in Zoom, and then that way we can kind of have some ebb and flow in the conversation. Uh, we're gonna do a short little survey. You've done these in all of the other kind of presentations. Um, so if Tanner, our Zoom tech, could throw that up, just select what position you're in um, within your city or town. So it looks like we've got a good mix of um, elected officials and um, city staff. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, Council Member Mendenhall and we'll get started. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, good to see you. Good to see everyone uh, on this uh, on this session. Uh, it's been great to uh, to see everyone connected uh, virtually uh, throughout the the conference uh, the last couple of days, and uh, and I hope you join us uh, tomorrow as well as we wrap things up in uh, what uh, will assuredly be one of the uh, league conferences that goes down in history. Seth likes to joke uh, with me and let me know I'm the president that. Uh, has done away with the uh, league uh, conferences and in-person things and stuff, and nobody else could hold that record. And uh, he likes to remind me of that. But uh, that's a record I didn't think uh, you know that anybody should want or or try to maintain. So I'm excited to to see you all uh, soon uh, when we get through uh, through the pandemic and uh, and uh, get on to to seeing each other uh, and uh, sharing best practices at conferences in person. Um, the neat thing about this uh, session in particular is this is something that uh, I think uh, regardless of being in person or seeing each other virtually, you will, you will gain uh, some, some good um, results, some good ideas from this session uh, regarding QPR, question, persuade, and refer. If you've ever, uh, or excuse me, if you've seen the, the, some of the sessions before now, uh, what I've talked about, I've alluded to it a couple of times, but uh, the long and short of it, so we can get on to Seth and Susan from Spanish Fork City uh, to tell you more about it, is a few years ago when we applied for grant funds in the Active and Healthy Program, uh, we were awarded funds to help the, uh, the, uh, the fitness of, of our uh, community. Uh, we initially had a, uh, the idea of how we could help the physical fitness of our community, the, the few things that, uh, that we suffer with, particularly down here in Spanish Fork in, in our area. Uh, that scope of what we were talking about changed when we had um, a tragedy in our community that I know you all experience in some, on some level in your individual communities, and that is uh, mental uh, health and um, and uh, depression and uh, and some of our youth succumbing to that and dying by suicide. Uh, so we retooled that uh, that program and thought we better be involved in both the physical and the mental health aspect of the the residents in our community. Uh, we ascertained early on that the cavalry was not coming, meaning if we didn't do something to help nobody was. And so you, you'll, you'll hear from Seth and from Susan how uh, we navigated those waters in what role, if any, do we play as a city? We decided we do play a role. And, uh, and so it, uh, it uh, became a lot of different things, but on the mental health aspect, it became focusing on, on QPR classes. What I will tell you from the outset is you do not need to win some large grant to start improving the mental health uh, of your citizens. The, the, some of these options are very low cost to no cost to make them available to you uh, and your residents who 
uh, when you have honest and tough discussions, there, there are some tough things going on in your community. So I'm excited. Uh, I can tell you the success of the program uh, is, um, is obviously, you know, starting with, with an initiative, but getting the mayor on board, getting council members on board, but then also being lucky enough in Spanish Fork to have a city manager who doesn't settle for status quo, but does, uh, is interested in finding ways uh, to, to work uh, better in our community. And then finding passionate, articulate uh, people like Susan Chapman inside our community too, that take on a cause and say, here's how I can help lift. And they do a lot better than any elected official uh, like me could, uh, could dream of doing. So I'm, I'm lucky to call them friends, but mentors and, and examples of leadership in this sphere. And I'm excited for all of you to hear from them. So with that, I'll shut up and, uh, and allow you to hear from them. Uh, these are two of the uh, best people I think we could find in, in our community, and uh, you'll learn a lot from them. Take it away, Seth. Thank you, Mike. That was very kind of you. Certainly uh, not deserved after all the pokes I've made at you, uh, especially you know with your memes and such. Uh, but that's very kind of you. This has been uh, one of the one of the most fulfilling endeavors I think that that I've been a part of as far as uh, you know meaningful meaningful work. Uh, we'd really love to make this be an interactive session. Wayne, is this as far as the Zoom setup for this particular one? Can everybody see everybody uh, in this one, or are they just seeing me? Uh, no. Nope. So, so this is everyone is participating, so Perfect. they can unmute and they can um, also they can choose uh, to join the dialogue. Okay, so if, if you could, uh, if you're comfortable, um, we'd love to see your faces, and if you have the ability to do that, not everybody can, but we'd love to see you if, if that's possible, and and be able to engage in a little bit more true roundtable conversation. Um, maybe to add a little bit of of just some simple history. And then we've got Susan, maybe 10 minutes. If you want to zoom through a, a couple of those slides and maybe pick what your highlights are as far as creating a community uh, community program. But, but this is not the silver bullet, uh, but it is something that when we have these challenges that we face in our communities, especially with teen suicide and just so, so emotionally, um, tragic tragic all around but just just tugs on everybody's heartstrings this is something that we felt very strongly that we can do and it gives people very productive ways to to work through the tragedies that have been and then hopefully uh prevent and we have we have had some success stories with this in order to be successful as uh, our council member said you don't have to spend a lot of money and that's part of the secret to one of the things we've done we, you do need some, some strong advocates and our, you'll see and hear from Susan here in a moment. And she is uh, definitely a passionate advocate. And, and part of our success is clearly because of her. And if you have someone in your community that is one of those advocates that has knowledge and skills that you can, you can tap into, then your, your program will, will be a lot more successful from the uh, outset. But then second of all, we repurposed a handful of employees in really simple ways. Um, and so to do QPR trainings, it's a lot like CPR, question, persuade, and refer. And, and they go out and do trainings in groups of, of 20 to 30 people. And uh, we, we literally called four employees in that had some relationship to the community. One was an HR, our HR manager who has a connection with all of our employees. A couple of them were in our recreation department that have uh, community connections already through the programs that they administer. Uh, and then uh, our victim's advocate. Uh, let's see, did, who else did I get or miss, Susan? Those, those types of employees, and we just simply asked if, if we could, uh, we'd like to train you to do this, and we'll pay you, whether you do it during the day or you do it maybe on nights or at weekends, we'll pay you, you'll be on the clock, you'll get some overtime if need be and uh, be a part of this as a trainer. And every single person has said, yes, they've enjoyed it. And really the additional cost is minimal. We probably spend more on supplies than we do on time, uh, but it's in the order of uh, just a few tens of thousands 
uh, in during a whole year. It's really not that much. The larger the town, it might be more, and the, the smaller the town, it might be a little less. But it really isn't overwhelming. And that, for me, was a big surprise and um, has been wonderful. So maybe just to start off, this effort doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It really is inexpensive. And uh, you, chances are you have a lot of the expertise already within your community if you just harness that. So Susan, why don't you spend a few moments talking about um, talking about what we've done, that the, what the program is, and then let's open it up for some question and, and dialogue here with the group. All right, my uh, connection has been a little, little bit spotty. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can everybody hear me okay? You're breaking up a little bit though. So am, I, am I breaking up? I might have to switch to, can, let's see. Just unmute. And, and Wayne, if you want to call up those slides. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot better, Susan. All right. So, um, well, there, now just a little bit of my background story. Wayne, if you want to call up. Oh, I need to mute this. Can you see those slides? Yeah. Okay. So we originally, I, I, and the most important thing about this is having city leadership invested. And so I really want to commend all of you for being here and coming to this presentation because we realized I, my background is in public health. Um, a while back, I was the public information officer for Utah County Health Department. Um, and I'm going to actually skip to this slide. This, this gentleman right here, his name is um, Mr. Ritchie, Don Ritchie. And I, if I could see all your faces, which I really can't in, in my view, but I would ask you how many of you have heard the story of Don Ritchie. And uh, this, the story of Don Ritchie is quite powerful. He was just an older gentleman that lived in a house by the sea. And um, he's really not a significant person in history or didn't have a set of skills that maybe we would really admire. But what's interesting is about Don Ritchie was, the, was where he lived. He lived in one of the more popular places in the world, and I use that word popular pretty loosely, um, where people would go and take their lives. And Don could actually see them from his home. And Don thought about it for a long time and thought, what can I do? I'm just an older gentleman that lives in a house by the sea, right? And, but he began to recognize some of the warning signs of these people and some of the things that he, they would do. And he decided in his words, he, he said, I just could not not do anything anymore. And so he began to approach uh, these, these people and ask them simple questions like, what are you doing out here? And tell me your name and how are you doing today? And would you like to have coffee or, or breakfast with me and my wife? And what's interesting about Don Ritchie is um, there were over 150 people that came back and said, Don Ritchie saved my life that day. If it wasn't for Don Ritchie, I wouldn't be here. And according to his family, he actually saved over 500 people because sometimes people don't come back. They don't come back and, and say, you made a difference in my life, but we, we know in, in encountering people that we do. So Don Ritchie was a person who just was there at the right time, in the right place, much like many of you are in your positions. And um, he was on the lookout and he just took a step forward into something that is a difficult issue and really cared and recognized the warning signs and, and did something. And I don't mean to oversimplify a situation because suicide and mental health can be a very complex situation but knowledge and a little bit of information in that helps us to become educated. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So why should cities be involved? Why are you here? And this question is something I thought about a lot. Being a person who has been in prevention and intervention in state, community, city, um, county positions, really those people who are in charge of, of prevention are county people who sit in desks far away from our cities. 
Don Ritchie was at the place. He knew the needs right in front of him, just like many of you in your towns and your cities. You know the needs of your communities, just like Don Ritchie knew. And so it's really important for cities to be involved because a lot of you are very invested. These are, these are your towns, your cities, your resources that will enact this. This problem is, um, I, I've watched this problem for a long time and I realized that there had to be more to countering this tide than what we were putting into it at these higher levels. It really has to be a community level change. Next slide. And there's some answers to this. Uh, we're gatekeepers. We are the house by the sea, essentially. And um, for a lot of people who work far and distant, there are statistics. But for us, we know that it was the, the kid next door or, you know, we know these, these situations personally. And, and we can ignite um, the actions of those around us to help us be involved in this, in, in this, in this situation that we're facing. Um, and let's go ahead and skip just for more. Next slide. So uh, this quote is um, that we just, there was a quote about from Greg Hudnall that it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a community to save one. And that's very, very true. And next slide. So there were a lot of different plans and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but what we did in our community was different in that we just didn't have a good idea and just didn't kind of sit down at a table and decide what we were gonna do. I really, having a background in community health and in prevention, I wanted things that worked. I wanted it to be evidence-based and I didn't just wanna go rogue. And so we utilized a lot of plans that were at the state and the county level and we just plugged them in to what we were already doing. And this is actually, it's not, it's not a very, it's not a simple process in that it just happens you just have to know what those programs and plans are. And so these were some of the, the strategies that I used and investigated first. And um, those, are, those are there, so next slide. Some, st some statistics that we should be aware of, that suicide is the leading cause of death of youth of ages 10 through 17. And there has been quite an increase in the last um, few years. Uh, suicide statistics we've heard in the news and the media, you know, how many people are dying of suicide and the truth is, is they are not released. Um, unlike other fatality rates that we're seeing in the news that are under high surveillance right now, uh, suicide numbers are just not released that often. We have to wait for them to come and to be released. That's just the way it's always been. So we do have more recent numbers than these, but, um, there was quite an increase in just the year, just five years. And that was one thing that piqued my interest in this topic. Next slide. Utah ranks sixth in the nation. Let's go to the next slide. So looking at these, this, uh, and, and if this were more interactive, you know, I'm actually, I do wanna ask, can I ask a, a question? Wayne, I can see your face. Can I ask a question to the whole group? What do you know? Okay, what do you notice about these states? What do all these states have in common? And where does Utah fit in these states? Anyone? I know it's hard to answer in this, but I want to hear at least. Okay, great. Thanks for rural and isolated. I can tell that I'm talking to a bunch of city leaders <laughs> because right off the bat, you hit some of the heavy ones. Rural and isolated. Yes, that's true. All of these states are rural and isolated. And rurality tends to correlate really high along with suicide rates. Anything else? We'll see if we can get one more. High elevation, hard winters. Yes, thank you very much. Wet West Rocky Mountains. Yes, very, those are great. These are great answers, good responses. Thank you for the responses, by the way. So right away we're hitting, again, you can tell that we're among a bunch of well-informed people. Another one, um, rough, roughly conservative, exactly. So one that goes along with, um, with our conservative group is uh, access to lethal means. And, um, and it doesn't mean, we have a lot of gun ownership and that often correlates with suicide rates. And it, what's interesting is in Utah is our, our sportsman 
uh, council and our gun owners have actually become very involved with our suicide prevention efforts. And this is a very good thing. And uh, we have appreciated their contributions. And it's funny, it's, it's interesting because we'll give our QPR trainings, which we'll talk about in a little while, in these rural places. I grew up in a very rural town and I was giving a presentation out there and we started talking about lethal means and gun usage. And I remember this little old man, just his, his eyes in the back snapped up and I could see him looking around like, this is gonna get good now, you know? I've been sleeping, but I'm gonna li listen. But, but talking about lethal means doesn't need to be a polarized topic because gun owners are very passionate about this topic in that they are the ones who are protecting people and they feel, about, they feel the same way about um, gun storage and, and locking away um, arms. And so they're, they're actually a portion of our population that we can utilize in helping us with this messaging. So um, just moving on on some of these things. Oh, let's see, let's just kind of skip through a few of these different presentations, these slides. Um, Brad, yeah, let's, let's keep going on. We've got some really good things. This, this slide right here basically is one of the more important slides. Uh, just it, we often talk about the, the tragedies of, our, of what's happening with suicide, but the truth is, is there are more people who survive and make it through these difficult times than there are the stories that we hear that are difficult. So um, I'm actually gonna skip through this one as well. There's a lot of good information here, but let's talk about this slide, which, which is basically what, um, can you still see me? All right, this slide right here. Uh, we talk about upstream prevention, prevention, intervention, and postvention, and they're basically all prevention. Uh, so upstream prevention is, it makes a difference in about five, eight, ten years, but it's really important. It's when we're working with kids, we're increasing uh, protective factors, but reducing risk factors. Uh, prevention is what we really traditionally think about when we talk about prevention. Um, it's, and this is between prevention and intervention is our QPR training. Postvention is sometimes neglected. It's when we're, we're talking about survivor support and what to do when there is a suicide. When we're in the middle of um, a suicide event, sometimes it's too late to plan postvention. We should plan postvention before um, because it, really our messaging for a suicide should be um, done before that. And depending on what we say and how we act dur during that as leaders and as communities, we can really impact the community around us. Next slide. All right, so we had five main approaches. Now, are there any questions? Please speak up during the presentation if you have any questions as we go along. And Seth and Mike, do you have anything that you want to interject at this time? No, if you I, do. Think, I think when we're done with these approaches, we can okay. ask a couple of questions, but yeah, go jump that into That sounds this. good. Susan. All right, so these were the Can you different. Hear me? Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. I, I thought I might <clears throat> add just a little bit of um, um, impetus to what I, I think is exactly why I came to attend this session. Um, so I just, uh, in an ecclesiastical position, I participated in Xander Brown's funeral in, in Salem on Saturday. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. That's the second kid within my neighborhood that we've lost to suicide. Salem Hills High School's got a moniker <clears throat> that is uh, Suicide Hills High School. And I know Bart Perry, who's the principal there, <clears throat> takes this very seriously and is very concerned. And I can tell in his voice that even with resources through Nebel School District, he is at a loss. I sat in city council two weeks before Xander's death. And I actually ran on this because of Allison Horton who died just behind my house. Um, she shot and killed herself under a bridge over here um, about 50 feet away. Um, and I know this is, this is somewhat dramatic, but I, I wanted to, to make sure there is um, some energy about what I think you're about to get into. First of all, I'm very frustrated as a city official because I don't know what to do, but I do know that cities play an important role 
I'm also frustrated a little bit by my council and mayor who I appreciate and uh, um, in, in many ways uh, look up to. So I'm not trying to be pejorative in any way, but I sat in council two weeks ago and I said, there is no resources available to our public at the very least on our, our community website. Uh, related to this, these are things I talked about when I ran and um, everyone in the room got highly uncomfortable and I had my mayor say, well, that's a bit morbid, isn't it? And I, 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 we can't bury our heads in the sand anymore. I can't bury my, I can't do this anymore as a public official, as an ecclesiastical um, leader. I can't bury any more of Salem's kids. Um, and I'm at a loss as to how to start this, how to make my council and mayor care. Cause I think some of those elements to our conservative community probably make them fearful about talking more about it. So with that, I'll, I'll be quiet, but uh, let me just say thank you so much for having this session. Um, I'm actually in quarantine and have COVID, but I wanted to make sure that I attended this session, even though I'm running a fever, because <laughs> this is that important to me. So I'll just, I'll leave that with you and um, thank you. Well, let, let me just say something really fast and then I'm sure Susan has a bunch of thoughts that she'll have just tailor-made for you. First of all, so sorry for what you are experiencing and, and going through. This is so difficult and it is extremely uh, draining and emotional for everyone. Um, and, and as close as you are to what you've experienced, it's all the more difficult. Um, you, you are not alone in feeling alone as a city because this is not our traditional role. We don't do health. That's not a, a city role. And as we started this effort a couple of years ago, frankly, one of my initial thoughts was this isn't what we do. We need to stay in our lane. Our lane is literally roads and our lane is water and sewer, et cetera. We don't do this. But we came quickly to understand that there is this place and space for us. And as I started with, it's not that hard. It's not as hard as we think, uh, but it is unnatural for our traditional roles. So you're not alone in feeling the way you do. And, and I'm, I'm here to tell you and, and witness, if you will, that it's not as hard to start. Um, and we'd be happy to, when we're done with this, we'll make ourselves available to you that we can consult a little bit individually. But we'd be happy to visit with your leadership there in Salem. Uh, we know where you live. And, uh, but give a little bit more um, stronger emphasis. But with that, maybe Susan, if you have any additional thoughts and then I think these five minute approaches that we took and some of the lessons that we learned will be helpful. And then I've got a handful of questions that I'd like to put into the group. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, maybe I know that this might be a little bit more information for a large session, but just so you know, I did, even though Salem's not within Spanish work limits, um, I'll just, I'll skip ahead and talk about kind of what we do is our postvention efforts. Um, postvention is very important and reaching out to those who have lost um, family members is really important. Um, so with Sanders family, I did get a couple of calls with their family and, and I did reach out to the mom. And um, what we usually do is we set up what's called a debriefing with the family and with our, with Wasatch mental health. And this happens immediately where it's the family and also with the ward. And this helps through the grieve, grievance process that's very shocking because to lose a teenager or a youth or anybody to suicide is a traumatic event. And these, these debriefings are done by professionals, two professionals come and they talk with, they usually talk separately to the youth. They have the youth trauma um, counselors there and then they talk separately to the adults. So I was able to talk to the bishop and get a hold of the bishop and set those up. Um, and they actually had the counselors in their ward, which was really nice. And then um, we touch base with the family and always try to work with family, friends, and uh, try not to breach, you know, uh, that, that line. But what I had, what we had done is we created a survivor support group because it's really important for survivors to get connected to resources as soon as possible. 
And the reason for that may sound a bit mechanical, but it's not because that, the human element is so important, but survivors themselves are more prone to suicide. So it makes sense to focus efforts on this population, but survivors that get resources and get in for counseling and help are less likely um, to die by suicide themselves. So, um, so what we usually do is we line up those debriefings and then we will have um, an outreach team, which is me and I'll usually line the mothers up with two other mothers or the family. So if the, the mother or the father has found the child in the suicide, and this gets a little bit personal here, um, then I will try to find um, one of our mothers in the group who has about six years progressed um, from their own suicide, who has gone through a particular training, who comes to the home and meets with the family and talks to the, the family. Or, you know, it, it just depends on the situation. And it's very, very helpful for them to talk to somebody who has been in that situation. So that's what's called an outreach team. And an outreach team is really, um, is really quite spectacular. And outreach makes a difference compared to a passive contact where they have to reach out and find um, the survivor group. But, and that's kind of just what we're, we have, what, what we're doing. And I would love to work with Salem City and helping them set up this. And it's really great to know that there's um, somebody that's passionate over there. So. Please, thank you. Yeah. And then there's more resources. We also do QPRs, which we wait for a while after there has been an impact like that to go into the community and to do those QPR classes. But the QPR classes help uh, a lot, actually, with the parents now who have a lot of anxiety about losing children because they learn the skills. Because a lot of them after suicide, especially when there's been um, one, you know, one or more or two or, you know, they or a cluster, they feel like it's going to be this thing that's going to come out of the darkness and, and sweep away their children in the night. And they have this feeling of helplessness. And when they learn the skills and learn the myths about suicide, it becomes very helpful to them. And we've had a lot of parents who walk away from QPR trainings feeling empowered and feeling that it's no longer this abstract problem that they can no longer solve. So um, that's part of our gatekeeper training. Um, but did you have any more comments on that? Or any more thought? We, we can pull up the slides and... No, I just wanted, I did, in fact, I'm sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> no, that's, that, but thank you. That, I think that was a really good illustration. I appreciate that. I know that's, uh, it's such a difficult situation and, and so hard, but that's very helpful. Um, so Mayor Dirk Burton asked what's QPR and I, I appreciate you asking that. That's, um, that will be our next thing. My, my computer keeps, uh, my internet connection for some reason today is really slow. I think everybody in Spanish Fork just got home and they are all online. <laughs> and so I'm guessing that it's up on the slideshow, but we, part of the five things that we did, oh, thank you. So part of our five main approaches, first we, we did gatekeeper trainings and I'll talk about that a little bit. Second was lethal means. The third is we formed a coalition because it's really important that we are not stuck in these silos of prevention. Any, any little, you know, anybody doing their part in prevention is good, but it seemed like we had the school doing their prevention, um, the county health department doing their prevention, and bringing us all at the same table is really important. I talked a little bit about postvention and then reducing barriers to care. So first, let's start with gatekeeper trainings. One thing that we went full force with, and let's kind of skip forward in the next uh, couple of slides, or the next slide. Let's go to the next. Let's keep skipping. Oh, we'll just skip these. It's a little skip, sorry. <laughs> there we go, gatekeeper trainings. So first of all, our QPR trainings, and there's also one called CALM. Um, we did these, we all, we did all these trainings actually. Um, so let me tell you about CALM really quick. That's not something that we do for the general public, but it is really good for ecclesiastical leaders. So if you as a, an ecclesiastical leader want to take this training, you can. You just have to look it up. It's called CALM, and it's, it's available through the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, sprc.org. 
And the, the background of Calm Training is we have plenty of healthcare professionals who will screen for depression and suicide and they'll talk to their patients about it, but that's where they stop. Um, that, and it's really important that they do not stop there, that they also talk about lethal means because with our suicide statistics that we look at, people will see their healthcare provi provider depending on the age group within the month of when they die by suicide um, on average. And so if the healthcare provider becomes more comfortable about, ta about talking about lethal means, guns being the almost sure way um, that a lot of them do die, because other means, um, yes, you, uh, pills will, you know, will be a way or asphyxiation, but guns are almost always lethal. So this makes it so that a healthcare provider can, if they find that somebody is contemplating suicide, they will help them to get resources. But in that time, they also talk to them about, you know, here's teenager here, mom, do you have any guns in the house? Are they locked up? Do you, you know, let's, let's talk about getting these pills, who's on prescription medication. Let's talk about removing the lethal means while we're getting help. Because sometimes getting help takes a while depending on the situation. So that's what the Calm Training is. I went to all of our major medical providers in the area and encouraged Calm Training and actually opened it up for them and showed them how to do it. And that was a very powerful thing that we could do. Let's go on to QPR. Now this has been a big push for our city. QPR is like CPR. And if I were to have everybody raise their hands, in fact, everybody where I can see you, just raise your hand if you've ever been CPR certified. I know that, you, has anybody ever been CPR certified? So here's where your chat box comes and I may not be able to see it. But what do you do if you see somebody on the ground who is unconscious? What would be the first steps that you do? Just write it in the chat box really quick. And again, I might not see it. So there's different things that we do, right? You can see each other's chat boxes. Okay, I'll call for help. Great, thanks, Tim. Annie, Annie, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, Annie, Annie, are you okay? Thank you. Ask if they're okay, ask if they're okay. Great. You observe your surroundings. There's really not a right answer here, just anything that you know, right? There's, there's steps, there's steps that we do. The same is true with QPR. QPR stands for question, persuade, and refer. Just as we, if we were to see somebody physically struggling or unconscious on the ground, QPR helps us to recognize when somebody is mentally um, in crisis and what the steps are that we need to take, the signs, and what the steps are that we need to take in order to get them help. As it, when I see somebody laying on the ground, I know that I'm not a, a help, I'm not an EMT. I'm not going to be the doctor who's going to help them place a whatever to help them breathe more. I need to help keep them alive long enough, long enough until the real experts arrive. And the same is true when I see somebody who's struggling mentally. I'm not gonna really dive into their childhood and try to fix their problem. That's not what I'm there for. I'm there to be a listener and I'm there to be somebody to sit in the dark with them and help them, give, give them hope that somebody cares. Because a lot of times we think that, it's, that we're trying to fix them or fix the situation but that's not always what they need. What they need is somebody just to listen to them. And that's what we do. Question, persuade, and refer, and get them to somebody who can help them. So uh, Seth talked a lot about the, this slide right here, who we, had, um, who we had trained. Let's go to the next slide. And this, we had a lot of presenters tra trained and we were able to train all of our school districts. Here's just a few pictures of that, of our trainees, and they were awesome. We trained the businesses. Uh, let's see, let's go to the next slide after this. Here's just an example of some of the locations in which we trained. We're almost to 2,000 fleet people trained in our community, um, which is great. This is kind of an older slide. So you can see that we've done a lot. We were able, we were actually able to go to Salem Hills and train, and, and that was one of, the, one of the best. We trained our 911 dispatch you know, we have a lot of stories, these trainings, and they were awesome. We've done them in Spanish. Um, so next slide. Reduce lethal means access in crisis. I've, I've talked a little bit about this. We were able to get gun locks and distribute them throughout. It's really important to distribute these at the library. We had the police department that was already distributing them 
the distributing them. But sometimes the police department can be a little bit intimidating. It's not a place that a person in need will always go to get a gun lock. And so that's why it's important to have them at the libraries. And Utah, a lot of places in Salt Lake already offer this. Some of you probably offer it. So you can get these free through your health department. You can get them in boxes and then distribute them that way. Um, we also did a lot of commercials. And now we're seeing these commercials a lot more because um, the Live On and the, and the state received some grant funding from this, but we were doing it before uh, with, some, with an additional grant, in which, I, which I received and we had them playing at our movie theater. This, uh, next, next slide. Uh, let's just keep going. We're gonna skip through this um, and go ahead and skip through this. So any time and distance that you can make, a lot of people say, well, if they don't die by guns, they're gonna die some other way. And the truth is, is that um, guns are, are, a pretty, are a pretty big factor. And it's a really difficult one to approach as city leaders because again, it can become polarized, um, but it really is a powerful, has a powerful impact. Let's keep skipping through. Uh, 10 minutes or less, if you can make barriers of 10 minutes uh, to put a barrier between a person who is having suicidal thoughts, then they're really likely to change their mind. And uh, that's, that's really important. Let's keep skipping to the next one so that we can go. Uh, keep going. And keep going. We won't show any of these videos. Let's keep going to the next part. All right, forming our coalition. Our coalition was an interesting group and it was very comprehensive. Um, let's go to the next slide. We had, we had everybody basically. We had our law enforcement, local physicians, school district, health department, universities, recreation department. We basically had almost everybody and we didn't have everybody every single time. And we um, can definitely do these uh, meetings a lot more often and make our coalition groups more efficient as we meet. So uh, how many of you, and go ahead and put it in the chat box, already have a Communities That Care program? Because what we've done is a version of Communities That Care. And um, so we've kind of patched it together on our own, but Communities That Care does what we've done. Let's go to the next slide. One, some things that came about from our group is that a law enforcement at our meeting uh, actually met up, met up with Wasatch Mental Health. And after this, they began meeting regularly. And our police chief, oh thanks, Twila has a great CTC program. So our police chief um, not only organized our, our local PD to meet with our mental health authority often, but he felt like it was such a good idea that he organized all the rest of the police departments in the vicinity. So all the South County police departments started meeting uh, very often with our mental health authority. And we can see even now in this situation that we're in with a little bit of turmoil, that that was a really good thing way back then. And so they had been synchronizing and working in an effort with our, health, with our mental health authority and, and that's been going on for a while. So it came through in a lot of ways, the coalition that we were doing. Um, so let's go ahead and skip to the next. Uh, so we learned a lot through this. Let's see, did you also engage nonprofits like NAMI? We did, um, yes, I worked very closely with NAMI I did invite them to our meetings, but it was more of a collaborative relationship in that they came to our city events. For example, we held, um, we've held a few events in which they came to. We also worked with like United Way, where we pushed this out to the public and our messaging. We have an online Facebook page that we do a lot of messaging and we continually, every time NAMI has a program that they announce, they send me information and we push it out to the public. So we do work closely with NAMI, but they're not always at our meetings, but um, our local representative is in our community and we communicate very, very often. So that was a great question. Um, things that we could do better. Let's skip to the next slide. I can't remember quite what we said. Susan, let's, said. Maybe, let's maybe pause here for a moment. Okay, thanks uh, Seth. And, and maybe just jump into a couple of, a couple of questions and, and 
I have a handful of questions that I'd like to get to, but maybe it'd be best to ask you as, as at the at the round table, what questions do you have so far? Wait, maybe we haven't explained very well or thoughts that you're having that we could address. And this is where you can unmute and talk. Yeah, so if anyone would like, you can put the your question into the chat box or you can unmute. And if you just introduce yourself uh, what city you're with and what your position is with the city and then ask your question. So while while we're waiting and you okay how does the city procedurally approach such programs so Tim that was going to be the, the question that I wanted to ask so Susan I'm going to ask it maybe from this perspective uh, as Tim is, has expressed his desire and, and uh, the that feeling of of exasperation even of how do I do this uh, maybe explain it from a perspective of Mike Mendenhall he doesn't know what he's doing in this arena he, he's he's just an elected official that's a banker right he doesn't know what to do what are the first and or second steps that he can take to maybe get something started what would you recommend as a first and second step that, that these officials maybe look at doing to start an effort within their community? So if, for example, if you were a school, um, I, would, I would take the approach a little bit differently, but you're, you're a city, so I, but I would ask the same question. What resources do you have? Your greatest resource, resource is, are the experts who are at the county health department that you work with? So reaching out to them and then being a connector, that would be your job is to be a connector between those who are the best at working with this and um, your community. So if you reach out to the, for example, our, um, our experts would be Utah County Health Department. We would reach up to them and say, hey, uh, we are really interested in doing this in our community and doing more programs those people almost always will be so excited to have a city official who is invested in a program. Um, there are also really good programs that are like Hope for Utah. And, uh, but I would stick with, uh, with the bigger ones like Hope for Utah or Utah County Health Department or NAMI. So working with those, I would start with those and become a connector. So, um, or a communities that care. If you can do communities that care, it works on substance abuse and suicide prevention and really works with those. Um, and they have, they have grant funding for this as well, but it works with those upstream prevention uh, post risk factors and protective factors. So I would start with that. So I, I think that's really important what she said, being a connector, and, and you might have seen, we skipped this slide, but you are not you do not need to reinvent something or invent something maybe in your mind. Uh, it exists. And connecting with your county resources, they are there and have these expertise already in place. Their problem is they aren't as connected to the resident as you are because you are the city that touches the lives of our residents every day in the different services that we already provide you and I connect with the residents so much better than our health department. And so to be able to take that health department resource, I remember in some of our, our very first meetings, the, the individuals that were coming from our health department were so ecstatic that they could bring their resources and then we would amplify them out to our residents. And we would be the voice saying, we have this course, we have this information, we have this place you can go. Um, and, and with that, Susan, as we began, and to this point, we're a year, maybe a year and a half into this, or maybe we're longer, sorry, uh, two years into this. How many people have we trained uh, and in what types of various settings? I think you already talked about maybe businesses and schools, but how many people do you suppose we've trained uh, in QPR already? We're almost at 2,000. And I've lost count of what types of businesses and settings. So we did, we did all the school districts, both in Spanish Fork, Salem, and not all of Springville, but we did the high schools. Um, and we did business settings. We have done a lot of church settings. And starting out back to um, the earlier comment, 
because of our, our community a little bit. At first, when we started out knocking doors, or at first when we started out, people did not want to talk about suicide. This was a taboo topic. Um, and it, I felt like I was cold calling and knocking doors, and um, that was a little bit difficult. And just a few months before, or just the month before COVID, we were booked out with QPRs. I could barely keep up with them with all of our trainers and tapping into the county resources. And so you could see either people were a lot more willing to do it, or um, it was just the need was so high and uh, it really was a needed thing. So yeah, we, we've trained a lot. Now, from a perspective of a person in the, in the private industry and in the public sphere, when you talk about training, people automatically go to, man, an all day training. I already got this and this and this I do for my city. When am I going to have time to do this, um, you know, after my day job and my family? What I can assure you is what, what Susan did so effectively was be clear to those businesses and those faith-based groups that we teach a QPR class in an hour, right, in a lunch hour. And so it's a group that you can only get up to about 30 people because you are talking about some, 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 uh, some subjects that are pretty heavy for some people and, and, uh, and, and that they maybe have a personal experience with. And so there are multiple trainers from the city that are in these, in, in these uh, trainings to, to help uh, people get through them and, and whatnot and, and watch while somebody else is teaching the class. But companies can do this in a lunch hour. We had one of our largest employers have us come multiple times and just serve their, 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 uh, their employees lunch the same way at the city we did that. And so multiple classes and it was through a lunch hour to go through QPR, hand out the material and study it. And uh, so, so again, it's not an all day affair. It's not a multiple day affair. It's, it's just a lunch hour that you can uh, become more acquainted with this stuff. Thanks, Mike. We, we found at least that you get more and more champions uh, that take on the call uh, as you begin to make these trainings and you connect. Every training that I've sat through, which I think I've been through an actual QPR class, I think now four times, uh, depending on, on different settings, but I will watch Susan and her trainers at those, and they're almost always engaged in one-on-one -on -one conversations for about 45 minutes after the class with people as they come in. And, and from those other people are wanting to connect in, how can I help? And, and again, how can I amplify the effort? And it really becomes a snowball that just grows and grows because this is something that really touches many more people than you and I may think. Um, and, and it's something about which it doesn't take a whole lot to make you or me passionate about it. And I will pause maybe and say, uh, you're all here, so this may be a choir comment uh, as preaching to the choir, but before we started doing this, uh, we, we kind of tracked what is the circumstance like in our community. And, and if you were to sit down with your police and dispatch folks and run a report on suicide calls that come into your individual cities, chances are it will look similar to ours. And I was blown away at the number of of despondent calls or actual uh, suicide active calls that come into our police every week. And it is often uh, four out of the seven days, four calls a week, five calls a week sometimes. And, and sometimes it's three in a given day. Um, but uh, on average, about four calls a week come in regarding suicide. Somebody saying, I'm thinking about it. Somebody saying, my friend has a gun and I'm afraid for him. Or somebody saying, I've just come upon something. Um, and, and so for us, we immediately knew we can't just sit back. We've got to try something. Uh, and so if you, if you, you can find out from your police chiefs and from your dispatch folks, what is, what is that call volume like in your cities? And it probably will surprise you uh, and if it's four out of seven days, that's a call pretty much every other day, right? Every other day, there's a call coming into dispatch saying, I've got a crisis. Um, and so you've got, you, you can be that man by the sea. Um, 
Ooh, Susan, they just said they want to have a session in St. George. And I think, I think I'm in, uh, maybe in a month when it's a little cooler, but, uh, I think we do it. Uh, we'll, we'll book it. Um, what other questions do you have? What are we not answering for you? Uh, and how can we maybe push you in a direction where you can, can feel empowered to, to move forward? While we're waiting for the questions, I do want to say one more thing about QPR. Um, when you do have a suicide in your community, there is this, um, this feeling that everybody wants to do something. And often you'll have wards and stakes and um, just community events of people doing their own trainings. And what, one thing that we've learned about suicide is sometimes the messaging can do more harm than good. And the thing about QPR is it's a very safe training. It's evidence-based. The way that we do it is it's, a, it's, it's not emotionless, but it, the emotion is, is very driven in the right direction. And we have trainers who only watch the audience for anybody that's triggered or in distress, and they will walk out with those audience members. And uh, it, it's very skill-based. So what happens is sometimes you have a suicide and then you have all these kind of side uh, trainings and things that people do, and they can, they can actually do a lot of harm. And so when you do have a program in place that you can do and offer, it, it decreases the rate. Um, and so it's nice to have to offer the community those, those programs and trainings that are beneficial rather than kind of these rogue trainings that sometimes surface. Um, in a time of crisis. So I have a comment and a question. Michelle Randall from St. George, Utah. Um, this affects me personally. My, my only brother committed suicide four years ago. And so obviously this hits near and dear to, to my family. Um, we have a Reach for Hope coalition here through Southwest Behavioral Health. But what I found is that they focus so much on the teen aspect in our schools, which is great. But two weeks ago, we had three suicides in St. George and they were ranged all ages. It wasn't teenagers, it was all ages. So I, I did go to our dispatch and ask them to look up the numbers for me for Washington County. And in Washington County, there were 92 either suicides or attempted suicides since January of this year. And 51 of those were in St. George alone. Mm -hmm. You know, so I went to our mayor and council and said, whatever we're doing is obviously not working. <laughs> we're not getting the messaging out there. People don't know where to turn for help. And we have city council today at five and and we are discussing this very issue. But how do you get, how do you, how do you get to the adults? Somebody who's in their 60s, 40s, we, we had a gentleman, a 78 year old. Um, how do you reach them? So um, we did get another grant that was all, that was only for males ages 35 and up. <laughs> and there's a reason for that, is if you look at the statistics, um, that, is, that is the age group. We often talk about youth because youth, it's, it's very heart-wrenching and, and it's very terrible. But if you look at the graph, youth are down here and then you have, it gets up into ages 45 for males and then it goes even up into seniors, it's really high. And so reaching the adults is a little bit tricky, right? Um, let's see, it helped me remember that question, Seth. But reaching the adults is very tricky and you have to reach them in different ways than the youth. And so there are programs, um, but it's not only messaging and education because the myth about suicide is that somebody wants to die. Um, they, they don't usually want to die. They usually have a, a problem that is difficult Right, and so helping them through this difficult time and to find other alternatives is, is really important. And so um, the QPR program is kind of an intervention or a, um, 
a way to help people recognize the signs and, and to do that. And that kind of reaches all areas. And then we have these other programs that are like everyday strong that hits the youth and hits kind of these younger areas. So I would suggest a QPR program because we're kind of in a crisis mode. When we're talking about these higher numbers, we are in a crisis mode that we need to focus on kind of crisis interventions. And then we also need to kind of get our portions through to our youth as well. But, but yeah, so hitting adults, we did some messaging, the lethal means that I talked about and things to try to look at your population to see kind of what's happening there. But, um, but there is, I would work with your health department and see what you can do because you will be an asset to them. And and help you. Let me add, um, I think, Michelle, thank you for that question. One of the things that, that you and I will never do, I think, is, is get the word out and stop everything maybe in a mass setting. But the more, uh, the more people that we are able to make comfortable having the, a tough conversation with their neighbor or friend in whom they may see some signs to where I can walk up to you and comfortably say, how are you doing? I, I'm noticing this. Are you having suicidal thoughts? Um, and just go right at the issue. And, and as Susan mentioned in, in her presentation, one of those slides that, that those suicidal thoughts that individuals have are often for a short period. And if a distraction or a, or a change of direction comes their way, they stop and oftentimes don't return ever again. Um, a good friend of mine described a circumstance where he was sitting in a car up in the woods and found himself going in a direction of thought he never ever thought he could, which was, I've got these pills. Boy, my life really is, has taken a turn for the worse. If I just take these pills, it would probably be over. And then he said, my mind just went down that road and it was bizarre to him. And thankfully for him and for all of us that are associated with him, there was a knock on his car window. And it, it happened to be a law enforcement officer who was asking, had you seen something in the area because he was looking for something totally unrelated to him? But that snapped him out of that thought process and, and basically was a slap in the face and, and he came to in the thought process of what am I doing? But for all of us that know him, it was really a very good description of it. Somehow that, that, that moment, if, if there is a good person there that can help them, will will save some lives. Uh, so the question that Michelle asked uh, Susan was, where are you applying for grants? And let me let me maybe say say one thing that is I think super important. Um, we all need a Susan um, in our towns. And I think I said this earlier, we all have um, Susans in our town. And if you say at your specific city, in your respective cities, uh, Seth, I'm going to give you this assignment, run with it. Chances are it's going to fail in my mind. And that's not because Seth's not capable, uh, but I'm not passionate about it. I have other jobs and other responsibilities, and I don't know much about this. So we found Susan not amongst our ranks. Um, Frankly, I don't know exactly the full story behind how we got Susan, other than it was Councilman Mendenhall and, and Susan, and she stuck her neck out in one of our public hearings about a life center, a recreation center, and got kind of mobbed by all of the people that didn't want this particular bond to pass. And that created a connection for uh, Mike and Susan. And, and a few years later, um, we, we have her doing all of this for us. But Finding community champions who aren't city employees, I think is one of the best ways to start. And it might be somebody that has suffered through the experience close to them. It might be somebody like that. In Susan's case, it's somebody who has training in, in community health. Uh, she has a master's degree in community health and is passionate about helping people live healthier lives. Uh, but finding somebody probably not amongst your ranks already to help you lead this effort is a great way to go. And now, like I said, two or three years later, Susan does work with us and she is employed by us uh, as a part-time employee and, and we love what she's doing. And uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of, of money to, to pay for what she's doing, but she's fulfilling what she wants and fulfilling a, a tremendous need that we have. 
and it's a perfect relationship. So I, one of the things I would add to how do you start is find your Susan. And, and, and who could that be? And how could they help you? Because chances are you've got some passionate people in your communities already. And if I would have seen, for example, a Michelle, or I um, didn't get the gentleman's name from Salem, but if I, if I, and just like Mike reached out to me, I mean, the minute he reached out, it was, you know, I'm a champion, I'm a, a campaigner, I'm a, uh, I, I, I'm passionate about this. And so seeing somebody else that even gave me a little bit of room, um, you know, that you have those people in your community. And I was really, really grateful for the investment and the ear and they showed me that they were willing to listen. And that was really, really important. And I did want to go back to Michelle's comment a little bit. One thing that we didn't talk about was addressing barriers to care with adults. Um, a lot of times they have barriers to care to getting help. And that was where we worked with NAMI. And we have a Facebook page in which we addressed that I address a lot of times the resources that are available in the community. Uh, we've, we've been talking about telehealth and some different things on our Facebook page and Mike actually started that Facebook page and I run it and so it's been it's been really good. You can email me with any questions. Seth just put my email up there. Um, I am happy to answer any questions that you have about getting um, getting started. Colin Karchner did a podcast with us and we detail a lot of this as well. It's kind of like what we just talked about, but we go in a lot of detail and he's a lot of fun if, if you don't know who he is. But that was a fun podcast that we can send as well, so. Any, any other questions? Uh, oh, sorry, we didn't get to Michelle Jensen's question of where are we applying for grants? Oh, the grants are difficult because I, it's like a treasure hunt. You have to find them. You have to be kind of on these email lists. Um, I just, I hunt for the grants. And so uh, it just depends whether it's through the local health departments, um, the state health departments, that's where I hunt. Um, SAMHSA, I've got a grant through there. I got a grant through Intermountain Healthcare. Um, the first initial grant was the one that Mike found um, and it was through Utah League of Cities and Towns and through um, and through that. So the, the Facebook page is Spanish Fork Active and Healthy. And you can kind of see the posts. We've, we try to keep things light and happy, especially at this time. Thanks, Mike. He posted that. He did a really good job of getting that. And people have really appreciated how we've kept things light. We've kind of put this bubble around information at this time. Um, even though we do talk about mental health and suicide, um, it's been good. We do a lot of fun posts on there. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a Facebook page where I know you as elected officials see many Facebook pages in your community and, uh, and it can be one of those that you're like, holy cow, why would I ever log on to Facebook ever again? I, I, I would say if you get down this road, a Facebook page separate from all that noise that is just focused on good information, good data, and ways to help your citizens be more active and healthy, especially on the mental health side that we're talking about. It's free from a lot of the drama and it's simply a place where our residents like to go and get information uh, of, uh, of these classes and everything else. So pretty good stuff. It has been nice. It's, it's politics free. Um, it's drama free and, and people post, these are the fun things I'm doing and it just creates an energy about that discussion. Really, really uh, positive. Yeah. We well, do a giveaways a lot too. I mean, that's been good. We've used a little bit of the grant funding for that where people will post pictures of their family exercising and it's, that's really been, that's been fun, so. We've done a couple of health challenges even based out of that page. Well, I think uh, maybe we are out of time here. Susan, any final thoughts you wanna share and then Mike, you can end it. Yeah, just that, um, just this last little push, you may not be a gentleman, an older gentleman that lives in a house by the sea, even though we all kind of want to live by the sea right now, but you may see a sea of faces each day, um, whether it's on your Zoom meetings or when you go to work or just with your family. And you just never know when you're at a crossroads to be a decision maker and to be somebody that can really make a difference in this. 
And this isn't a perfect art. It, it is a little bit messy in trying to figure out how to do this. But I've seen again and again through this effort that where there is a willing heart, there is a way. And we can make a difference in our communities by being focused on mental health because this is one of the biggest public health crises that we are facing at this time, um, along with many others, but this really deserves our, our minds and our thoughts. Um, so again, I just, I appreciate the time that you've given me. And um, if you have any questions, my email is in the chat window and I would be more than happy to take the time to talk to you about your individual circumstances in your cities and what you would like to know from me and more an individual basis. So thank you. Seth already mentioned this, but as a local elected official, you, you guys are relied on more than you, you probably even know uh, for, uh, for direction um, to, to, um, to grow and to maintain and protect the quality of life, whether it's in Salem, St. George, or anywhere across the state. People live in your communities for a specific reason, and it's just, again, not because the toilet's flush and because the garbage pick is picked up, but they love where they live. They love something about it. And you do play a role on this, this side. And this is a, a tough thing that we're dealing with up and down the communities in the state. Um, you do play a important role in this space and you don't need permission. I'm not asking you to go get permission from your city manager or from your mayor or from your council. Again, I already said this, but hashtag find your Susan. You find somebody passionate about it in your community. If it's not you, and you both work together because your community does want somebody to uh, help in the, in the in the political space of um, of mental health and the physical health, their well-being. So 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 do it. Just take some steps, and like was said, it might be messy, but take some steps because uh, the cavalry is not coming. It is it is up to us to to help our our residents, and they trust you more than they trust a whole lot of people right now, especially when it comes to government. So. Thank you guys. Anything we can do, just please reach out any at any time. We'd love to help. Well, on behalf of the league, I'd like to thank Seth, Mike, and Susan for taking some time today and for the information they've shared and to everyone who participated in today's call. So thank you again, and we will see you tomorrow.